ecosystems. What are they, how we affect them, and what we can do to protect them. We're going to start with what an ecosystem is. The Oxford Dictionary defines ecosystems as biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. This complex network of interconnected systems and their relationships with each other is the key defining factor of an ecosystem. If one part of the system is disrupted, it affects all of the rest. Depending on categorization, the number of ecosystems in the world varies, but it tends to settle in the range of 8 to 15. Some of these examples are coral reefs, prairies, rainforests, deserts, and savannas. As there are a large number and variety of ecosystems, there is also a vast number of environmental problems and causes associated with them. There's pollution, overexploitation, population, long-term effects. We're gonna start first with pollution. So there's biological, such as viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. There's chemical, which can be broken into organic, such as crude oil, solvents, hydrocarbons, pesticides, plastics, detergents. There's some inorganic, such as metals and their salts from mining, ammonia, sulfur from car emissions, inorganic fertilizers. There is also airborne pollution. Some is natural from wildfires, volcanic disruptions, or storms. There's also human-made from mining, transportation, coal power plants, waste incineration, and uh, the use of fossil fuels to heat and cool our homes. We can also get pollution from water runoff. The annual volume of livestock waste in the United States constitutes the largest contributor to the pollution of America's waterways. This causes nutrient buildup, which leads to algae, algae blooms and oxygenation. This causes a disruption to the normal ecosystem. Waste lagoons have also burst or been underwater in high rains or hurricanes. This can also lead to the biological pollution to the water from the feces of the animals. We also have yard runoff from fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that we use on our lawns. Light pollution is another form, and light pollution is caused by artificial nighttime lighting is a global environmental change affecting terrestrial, coastal, and marine ecosystems. One example of this is when sea turtles hatch, they go towards the brightest light, which with coastal development is not the moon. Overexploitation is another problem that we have. There is an observable tendency for powerful and wealthy societies to overexploit, damage, and even destroy their natural environment support base. This can be through deforestation, logging, mining, oil drilling, recreational misuse, and poor fishing practices. We also have an issue with population. We have a loss of biodiversity. As we expand and accommodate more homes, we destroy land and reduce the number of diverse species, whether they are plants or animals. We also spread invasive species. Just looking at the Minnesota DNR website, there are almost 90 different invasive species in the state of Minnesota alone. We also do coastal development, which is pushing the limits of our space, and they are the hardest hit in a storm. Some long-term effects are desertification, where the fertile land becomes a desert due to drought, deforestation, or poor farming practices. We have ocean acidification, which is a lower pH caused by an increased consumption of CO2. We have salinity, which is the amount of salt in the water. We have increased ocean temperatures. This map shows how the average sea surface temperature around the world has changed between 1901 and 2020. The average increase is between one to three degrees Fahrenheit. We have an increased fire incidence, and of course, the greenhouse effect. Why do ecosystems matter to us? Ecosystems are how all life survives. We all need food, water, clean air, shelter, and a hospitable climate. The Earth is a multifaceted ecosystem of systems within systems. Adverse impacts produced in one place diffuse globally, eventually affecting all places. Some contributors to the problems. There are a variety, starting with state government, 
corporations, individuals, and natural. Within the state and government, due to the need for funding, the government has been able to exert substantial control over research. This means that the government is able to dictate which research studies get done, and whether they are beneficial to the long-term health of the environment or to building up military power. Through previous acts of imperialism, the US and Europe have taken claim to many resources. Often a powerful nation's practices prohibit another nation from self-governance, and this is frequently done in order to gain access to valuable ecological resources. There is a direct tie between the government size and the amount of pollution they produce. They tend to use more resources, which produces more toxic products, which means more waste is produced. This is also called the treadmill production, where economic stability is reached by producing more and more. Political institutions interact to produce ecological disorganization while creating wealth and power for a minority of persons. One example of this is the recent bleaching event at the Great Barrier Reef and how it shines a light on the Australian government's response. They said that these repeated bleaching events have hit the tourism industry hard and are a blow to everyone who loves this incredible natural wonder, which is home to a vast array of sea creatures. The Australian government has committed $700 million towards protecting the reef, but based on the comments, it is more about protecting the money that comes from this ecosystem being a tourist stop. The Australian government has also recently lobbied to exclude the reef from a listing of heritage sites that are in danger. Deep sea mining or blue growth is another area where the government is dealing with. The mindset of using this resource of the ocean more and disrupting this delicate ecosystem is to gain more power and resources is another clear example of the treadmill theory. The proposed options declare that there would be no loss of biodiversity, but that would be an impossible goal. It's more about replacing one ecosystem with another to compensate for the biodiversity loss. This also flows into risk theory of what is an acceptable loss. The government talks more about the benefits such as carbon sequestration and oxygen production, along with fishing and pharmaceuticals. Corporations are another contributor to the problem. They have grown to an enormous size and have an ever increasing amount of power. Governments tend to bow down to corporations because they need money for campaigning. Corporations put forth the money in exchange for cutting regulations and the health for the people and environment. The greater the productivity, the greater its profitability. Productivity typically has negative effects on the social fabric of a society and the ecological sustainability of its natural environment. One example of this is deforestation. These forests are used or cleared for a variety of products from palm oil, soy, cattle, rubber, paper, and lumber. Deforestation has been shown to greatly affect the amount of rainfall in Africa. There are a variety of different types of companies that benefit from or support this problem, from the producers and traders, the banks, lenders, and then the consumer brands. Another example is the gold mining in Ghana. Large-scale mining is ran by multinational companies. Small-scale mining is considered illegal or banned by Ghana, but it is still expanding. This ban has led to social unrest because it is hard to obtain land and licensing. Individuals also contribute to the problems. One example is that of a perfect lawn. To many, it is a sign of success, but it is sprayed with pesticides, insecticides, which end up washing down the drain or into our bodies of water. It is also a desert to important insects. Lawns are intensively managed and they are offering limited habitat opportunities for both plants and insects. Lawns are biodiversity poor and ecologically insensitive. We tend to choose the same plants and trees as everyone else on our street. We also are complacent to the treadmill of production. We are easily swayed by advertisements. We allow planned obsolescence, we continue to build larger homes that require more materials, and we don't ask questions. Where do our products come from? How much waste is produced by them? Where does our waste go when it's done? We are also influenced by nature work. Nature work refers to our culturally influenced interpretation of nature. Depending how we are taught, some are taught that the world is precious, and some are taught that it is something to be used for our profit. We are 
Influenced by advertisements that say it's important to buy a new phone every year, and that plan obsolescence is okay. Everyone sees the world differently based on experiences and culture, where they live, and what they see. Another contributor to problems is a natural one. Natural disasters such as volcanoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, all change and affect ecosystems as well, along with weather patterns such as thunderstorms, dry and rainy seasons. We also have excessive population. So for example, the Koki frog in Hawaii, the Burmese pythons in the Everglades. We also have a lack of or decrease in population with animals such as bees. And there is currently 16,306 endangered species. Some of the social consequences of this, for example, with deforestation, Africa is dependent upon the rain produced from the rainforest ecosystem, and they will be unable to maintain their agricultural systems without it. A total deforestation could result in up to 50% of annual rainfall loss in African countries. They are already expecting a loss due to climate change and increased temperatures. Yet their population is expected to double by the year 2050 and many are displaced from their homes in favor of plantations. Another social consequence is with the RSPO certification. This helps make sustainable palm oil and higher yields. Many of the large producers are members, but it is a challenge for smallholders to join this. There is a requirement for group organization and land legality. They have a limited capacity and capital for land management improvement. There's the lack of knowledge and connections, the cost of certification, they are untied to mills and they have no guaranteed access to markets. And even if they are members, they can be rejected in a surplus. We will also use the example of gold mining in Bolivia. The gold mining leads to many migrants coming for work, but this can cause issues with the increased demand for land. It causes an inequality for income favoring the young, it can lead to more drugs, alcohol, and disease. It causes an excess demand on services such as hospitals and schools and unemployment when mines close. In response to the situation, local communities are demanding compensation far above what they have received in the past. They want infrastructure, training for mining or other jobs, social services, including education and health. Some ecological consequences of deforestation is our loss of biodiversity. Some animals are already endangered, such as orangutans, pygmy elephants, tigers, etc. This causes less rain or desertification. Rainforests have high evo evapotranspiration rates, which releases the organic compounds needed for raindrops to form. And the change in the use of the land results in a loss of a full ecosystem. Some other ecological consequences can come from invasive species, such as the Koki frogs in Hawaii. They are considered a pest and injurious to wildlife. They have no natural predators. They eat huge quantities of insects, which affects pollination. And they disrupt the ecosystem. Another example is with invasive plants. They compete with native plants for resources, which they can do rapid growth, choking out the natives. This loss of biodiversity hurts native bees and other pollinators reliant upon the certain bloom times and for the plants to thrive. Another example is with overfishing. The overfishing of sharks and marais lead to an excess number of parrotfish, which eat and destroy coral. Another is the Triton's trumpel seashell, which is wanted for its shell for tourists. They are a natural predator to the crown of thorn starfish, which can eat 50 to 150 square feet of polyps or coral reefs per year, eating 15 inches a minute. Fertilizer also contributes to an increase of the algae, which the larvae of this starfish thrive on. Marine biologists, when faced with thousands of these crown of thorn starfish, will try to intervene to try to protect and save the reef. Healthy reefs can usually recover from an infestation after 10 to 20 years, but most reefs are no longer healthy. Some ways that we can help our ecosystem is to break free from the treadmill. We should leave no trace. We should be mindful of that everything we do has an impact. We should be mindful of invasive species, of picking flowers, coral, moving firewood, 
anchoring a boat. We should plant a variety of plants, even in urban settings. We can write to our representatives. We should ask more questions about where our products are coming from and where our waste is going. We should support local farmers. Go to farmers markets. Choose products that are healthy for you and the environment to help push the drive for similar products. You should do your own research, challenge your thinking, and teach others. Have hope that the little choices and actions that we make will cause big changes at the corporate and